Discussing today's topics from an African-American perspective, this is Another View. And it's going to be Manuel in lane three. Olympic record, Manuel Nalekshek. We've got... It's a dead heat. Dead heat. Oh, my goodness. We have dual Olympic champions in the 100 freestyle. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Barbara Ham Lee. Welcome to Another View. It was thrilling to watch Simone Manuel become the first African-American woman to win the gold in the 100-meter freestyle. And it was frustrating to read on social media that African-Americans don't swim because they sink. They have no buoyancy. That's just one of the many stereotypes about blacks and swimming that we will bust wide open today on today's show. Let's meet our guests. Uh, Dr. Cassandra Newby-Alexander is a professor of history at Norfolk State University and the director of the Joseph Jenkins Roberts Center for the Study of African Diaspora. Hi, Cassandra. Hello. Welcome back. Thank you. <laughs> Dr. Angela Jones is a psychologist in private practice here in Virginia. How are you, Dr. Jones? Very well. Thank you. Good. Thank you so much for joining us. Leslie Paul is the creator of Raps, Really Awesome People Swimming. Hi, Leslie. How are you? Great. Welcome to Another View. Thank you for having me. <laughs> and my co-host for Another View on Health, cardiologist Dr. Keith Newby. Hey, Keith. How are you? How you doing? I'm hanging in there. How about Good. yourself? I'm okay. So, look, Good. I'm going to take you back to your days in medical school uh-huh. because you had to learn about the whole body. I know you focus on the heart. Yeah, now, that, that, but, that, was, that was a minute ago. Well, but, uh. <laughs> we know it was a minute ago. But, but my question to you is, when you think back on those days, were you taught that African Americans could not, weren't buoyant, that they had denser bones, that, that that's a reason why they aren't good swimmers? Well, actually, you know, no. Um, that wasn't something that you would you would hear about that through different venues, but um, the reality was in, you know, when you were going through anatomy, um, you know, you have cadavers that we had to work through, some African Americans, some Caucasians, some other uh, nationalities, and, uh, you know, there was never an issue to say, okay, we had this this black person here, okay, you got to look at this bone structure because this is a different bone structure than this Caucasian person here. So the realities are that there is, you know, we, I've never seen true, not not just the written word, but just true evidence that there was any difference between the various um, individual cultural, I guess, backgrounds or, you know, racial backgrounds to say that that was going to be a difference in terms of what you're reading here today. Well, I I found this article mm-hmm. on, on uh, the web. It's from a um, magazine called FT Magazine, and this article was written by uh, David Owen back in 2006, mm-hmm. okay? And he is quoting a book called Taboo, Why Black Athletes Dominate Sports and Why We Are Afraid to Talk About It by John Entine. I'm not afraid to talk about it. (laughs) (laughs) John Entine is a scholar in residence, was a scholar in residence at least in 2006 at Miami University in Ohio. And he said, quote, I don't think there's any question that there are physiological factors that help explain why swimming is such a white sport. He said it has been known for hundreds of years that blacks are, quote, sinkers, unquote, because they don't have natural buoyancy. Black skeletons, on average, heavier than white. We also know that blacks have, on average, less natural body fat for no other reason than they that they evolved near the equator. <laughs> Wow. 2006. Yeah, I know. I Dr. Know. Cassandra B. <laughs> Alexander, our historian of the group, put some historical context, please, around this. Where did that come from? Uh, <laughs> it comes from the old pro slavery writers' arguments. You had uh, physicians, white physicians, throughout the 19th century who wrote, uh, who were trying to actually prove that blacks were not really human that the differences were so dramatic, were so stark, were so obvious. Let me weigh the, the uh, brains of whites versus blacks. Let me measure the skull size. Let me look at the body structure. And their, their objective was always to prove that blacks were not the same as whites. And more importantly, to prove that they were closer to being apes than humans. Mm-hmm. And so it's not surprising to me that even in 2006, someone would whip out one of those old 
stereotypic perspectives of African Americans, especially when it comes to swimming. Because swimming, unlike some of the other recreational sports, was seen more as a uh, a social activity as opposed to a sports activity. It was okay if black who were baseball players, whites who were baseball players, played games together. But the moment you actually engaged in swimming, you were in the same space, you were sharing the same water, that then entered into a taboo area that was almost sexual in in a lot of people's minds. And so there was considerable resistance to not only integrating pools, whether we're talking about the nation's capital, whether we're talking about in Las Vegas, California, New York, New Jersey, all over the country, there was resistance. And you see this in the records really starting after the Plessy versus Ferguson case in 1896 and going through the 20th century. But African-Americans were resisting that and filing lawsuits as early as the 1920s and and things began to open up in northern areas, although there was quite a bit of violence and fighting going on because whites saw this as their social space. And so after that, then you started to see the continuation as an excuse as to why blacks and whites can't swim together. And then this excuse coming out, well, black people can't swim anyway, and these are the, the mm-hmm. physical reasons why they can't swim. Mm-hmm. But, Leslie... The fact of the matter is, according to the CDC, 70% of African Americans say they either cannot swim or they have poor swimming skills. Exactly. So so talk to me. Your program focuses on African American children. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And why, why did you start that? What is, what's I, behind it? I read an article um, in 2006 about the high rates of drowning among minorities. And at the time, I was teaching at Old Dominion, and they were getting ready to f- close the field house. So, you know, after reading this article, I thought, you know, I can do something about this. And so that's how RAPS came about. I, I started it and thought, I can, I can change these statistics. And so when, when your students come in or when people come in to you to say, teach my child to swim, what are some of the things, do they talk about reasonings why they never learned in the first place? A lot of the children that we get are from disadvantaged households. And so there's many reasons. They, they don't belong to the rec centers. They do not live in neighborhoods that have neighborhood pools. You know, a lot of, a lot of neighborhoods have their own pools that people can go to. But the kids that I teach don't have those, don't live in those neighborhoods. Uh, the parents cannot afford the swim lessons. You know, you've got to decide what you're going to pay for if you're going to put food on the table, the roof over the head, or swim lessons. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, that's that becomes a, becomes an issue. It, it becomes an issue. So, so Dr. Jones, psychologically, when you listen to what Cassandra talked about in terms of historically. We were separated. African Americans were separated um, and and kept out of waters. And as you move forward, you don't have pools in communities, et cetera. Psychologically, what does that do to a person in terms of how they feel about even thinking about getting in the water? Well, I think back to um, what I often talk to some of my parents about in therapy, and I tell them that our children um, don't do what we say. Our children do what we do. And so if you have a historical, um, you, historically you have great, great grandparents who have not swam or who are fearful of water or who have had history of drownings in the family, um, that leads grandparents not to swim, leading our parents not to swim. And again, our children watch us. Even babies have the ability to sense fear in us. And so if our children see this, this is going to be a deterrent for them. Um, they are going to move forward with what has been passed down to them. So I feel it's an inherent um, fear that's learned um, from from us from a historical perspective. Mm-hmm. So, so let, Leslie, let me get you to, to scoot over. We do stream this live, and you're out of the shot, and we want people to see your beautiful face. So <laughs> if I can get all of you all just to kind of scoot over just Wait, a little bit. You know, they, they also, that you know, a lot of that comes into play. Uh, with health care mm-hmm. as well, when you talk about health care disparities, and we think we talked about that not too long ago, 
uh, that same theory holds true with mm -hmm. that as well as you talk about swimming, what you're exposed to. Because if your parents don't go to the doctor very much, if your grandparents didn't go to the doctor very much, therefore you probably will not either. So there is, I think, it's, it's not so much a genetic issue, it's just a cultural, social issue as well that you choose to do that. Mm -hmm. But the point was very valid about access. Because I see that as the biggest issue uh, is lack of access to be able to do that. And then, again, if, if you have somebody not pushing it, you know, meaning they don't, may, they don't want to create the access for you, um, most people are going to just, they don't think about it. I, I don't know if it's so much as an, an intentional I'm going to avoid it. You know, if you don't have exposure to it, you don't really it's think about it. It's not part of your, yeah. your right. everyday. Yeah. And can doing, I follow up ahead, with sure. what Keith was saying? Um, you know, a lot of African Americans in this country um, at the turn of the 20th century, they were coming from rural communities. Mm -hmm. And these are rural communities that did not often have access to water. And once they moved into cities, then some of them began to swim on their own. Some of them were taught because... For example, Norfolk was a big port area. The majority of people who worked the maritime industry were African American. They were the ones who plied the seas. So they weren't afraid of water, and many of them knew how to swim. You didn't see a high rate of drowning among that group. But as we moved into the 20th century, um, the, the cities created s pools giving people public access, but always either for African Americans they were limited to maybe one or two compared to 20 or 30 for the white community, or they had no access at all, and more likely they had no access. And so then you're talking about generations brought up in the 20th century with no access to water. And those who then did go into the rivers and streams, you had a high rate of drowning because they, they didn't, didn't know. really know and the, the currents were a factor in a lot of these drownings, whereas was, you didn't have that in the pools. I was reading that, that even with the New Deal after the, um, the Great Depression, that they did not build pools in black communities. They built them in the white communities. No, in fact, they the shut black. down a lot of the pools because of the violence. So here you have a situation where you have recreational divisions that had pools. The a Department of the Interior through the Park Service was taking over these pools and saying, no, you're going to open these pools up to everybody. But then the violence that occurred with white gangs, essentially, uh, deciding to physically attack with knives and with other weapons, blacks mm -hmm. who were trying to use the pool, which was their legal right, mm -hmm. then the government stepped in and actually shut them down and never reopened a lot who, of those pools. Who was the... Um uh, actress, I believe she was an actress. Honestly, her, my, her name Dorothy is Dorothy Dandridge. Me, who who went in the pool and they in put Las the Las Vegas. In the, yes, <laughs> can you can you tell that story? Do you oh, know what happened? Well, you know, a lot people think that segregation only existed in the South, and by segregation, I mean exclusionary policies. And so, throughout most of the country, up through the 1940s, um, you had. Uh, exclusionary policies. And so blacks couldn't stay at hotels, They, you know, for the most part. So Route 66, well, you know, that may have been a fun place for a lot of whites. But for most African Americans, most of those motels and hotels on Route 66 excluded blacks from actually, be, you know, being patrons. And so mm -hmm. black people didn't really have access to much of anything. And so Dorothy Dandridge was performing at, um, I've forgotten which of the big hotels uh, in, in Las Vegas. Vegas yeah. and, but she had to actually enter through the back the door mm -hmm. to get to and, and ride up the kitchen elevator to get to her room. And uh, she was told that she, could, she couldn't have access to any of the, the restaurants and certainly not the pool. And she decided one day that was it. And she went in, and they tried to stop her, but she put her foot in the pool, and they closed the pool down, drained it. Drained the wow. whole pool. <laughs> wow. Oh my gosh. Fumigated the pool. <laughs> I can't believe it. Because she actually – and the thing is, what, what also is completely absurd about this whole thing about black people having a different bone structure is that – the majority of African Americans in this country who've been in this country for at least 300, 200, 300 years are mixed. They're not only mixed with different 
African ethnicities, but they're mixed with everybody else. And all you have to do is look at some of the uh, statistics coming in when blacks get their DNA. And in some cases, some blacks, some people who self-identify as black are less than 50 percent black. Wow. 440-2665 or 1-800-940-2240 are the numbers to call. To join our conversation, we're talking about African Americans and swimming. 440-2665 or 1-800-940-2240. Don joins us from Chesapeake. Hi, Don. You're on the air. Hey, I enjoy y'all's show every week. Thank you so Uh, much. I was a lifeguard. Uh some 50 years ago at the boys club in Norfolk and I was the only white face in there and I can tell you the 50 or so uh, young boys 9 to 10 they had no trouble swimming at all matter of fact there was one guy who had uh, had his arm cut off and he could swim as good as anybody else Mm -hmm. and uh, so I mean Norfolk, it goes back a long time that there were some facilities that uh, could be used, and why they ever shut the boys club down, I never never could understand. But uh, teaching swimming is that one of the challenges was to get people to relax. And swimming is a different activity than, let's say, football or basketball or something like that. And so that's that's where the challenge came in. But I can assure you is that uh, there was nobody in the pool that couldn't swim, and there were about 50 young men. And, of course, there's, uh, there was a movie of uh, Carl, Carl Brashear, who was the salvage diver who had mm-hmm. challenges becoming a salvage diver, but he went as far as he could in the Navy, and eventually he kept on diving with... Uh, with one leg. So there are many good examples out there, and certainly the young lady that won a gold medal in the Olympics, I think it's come far. But I would just encourage everybody to make it easy for anybody to learn how to swim, particularly in Great. this area. Thank you, Don. We really appreciate that because we do have a lot of water. Leslie, the, the kids that come in, they're excited? They are. They're they're excited. They're They're apprehensive. They're worried about you know, being able to breathe, being in the water is a whole different animal than, like the gentleman said, you know, playing football or, or out of water sports. You have to worry about being able to breathe. And so once the kids relax, it's, I mean, it really, they, it really starts pulling together. And one way to do that is that we include free time along with the lessons. So they get lessons and then they get free time. And as the week goes on, you see how much more comfortable these kids are getting in the water, mm-hmm. trying okay. stuff on their own. Let's see. Uh, Lisa, should we go to call two? David joins us from Norfolk. Hi, David. You're on the air. Hi. Good afternoon. So I'm in the Navy. I'm white. When I came in, I could barely swim. I could thrash about, you know, to move short distances. So I never really grew up swimming. And then, um, you know, I was in boot camp. There's a lot of us that had to remediate. And, you know, there was a good mix of white and black. But I eventually learned how to swim. And, you know, one of my previous commands, you know, I had a couple guys after I became a lifeguard that I was teaching how to swim that were black that wanted to become SEALs. And it was almost like it was impossible for them, they thought, and people around them. And then, you know, I taught a couple of those guys to swim, and then a couple more guys learned how to swim. And then it kind of became known that, you know, I teach black people how to swim. And I kind of got mad about it because it was like, it's almost like something impossible is being done. So one of the guys, he's like, hey, can you teach my friend to swim? And I just taught how to swim. And I said, why don't you teach him? You know how mm-hmm. to swim, and you're really good at it, and it gets you more time in the water, and you get more confidence you're teaching somebody else. And he's like, yeah, well, you know, you're really good at it. And I'm like, why don't you teach other people how to swim? And, you know, I had a lot of conversations. The guys were just mentioning how it just wasn't part of the culture. And, you know, they didn't have pools in their communities. And they could barely swim when they came in. And I was like, yeah, neither can I. But now I can swim pretty well. So it's like the RAPS program, I think, is great. You know, and just having it kind of come within the community, not having outside the community saying, hey, you need to learn how to swim and we can teach you. But having, you know, young men that are healthy and or whoever – you teach their, their, their peers how to swim, white or black. Okay. Thanks, David, for the call. Uh, Angela, I see you shaking your head. Yes. 
uh, this caller has brought up something very important. It's the, it's the issue of trust. And that's very important when you're coming from a space, uh, a history of fear. And so if you can have someone that, that looks like you to assist you and show you that they can do it, of course you would be more inclined to do it, and I think it would decrease uh, anxiety levels in children and adults. That's a, when you teach the children, their parents prob- do or may or may not know how to swim. So do you work with them, with the parents also, or, or do you talk with the parents about try not to transfer that fear that Dr. Jones was talking about earlier? I do. When, when parents sign their children up, my first question to them is, do you swim? And we, we have had quite a few parents. I said, let's make it a family affair. If they're, if they're signing up three or four children, I said, come on. You know, we'll put you, we'll put you in the program also, and then you can enjoy the water with the kids also. Okay. If you're just joining us, we're talking about African Americans and swimming with historian Dr. Cassandra Newby Alexander, psychologist Dr. Angela Jones, Leslie Paul with the Really Awesome People Swimming or RAPS program, and cardiologist Dr. Keith Newby, my co host, for another view on health. So, Keith, you're going to get a kick out of this one. Um, but I think we'll go to line four first. Janice joins us. Janice, you're on the, li- on the line. Yes. Hello. Uh, I'm very happy to speak about swimming. My children uh, learned to swim in Flint, Michigan. They were six and nine. They're African American, and it was one of the best exercises they ever had. Uh, the problem with with children, as you said uh, before, is that sometimes pools are not available. They were available in Flint, but uh, where I moved from in Harlan, Kentucky, I remember when we actually got a pool, and uh, it was. It was daunting, but we certainly use it when we got it. But I did want to say something about the sport and their swimming. They started off uh, very poorly, and we found out that most children begin swimming at three, four years old. And But when they did, it was a team sport, and it was one of the best things they ever did. So you highly recommend it. <laughs> Janice, where are you calling us from? I'm calling from my car. Okay. <laughs> Are you here in Hampton Road? I'm calling Road? from my car. No. <laughs> I had to stop because they had, and they managed to win. By the way, they're also uh, when they win their their uh, their their medals or their whatever it is, it's on a tier basis. In other words, it may be A, B, or C. Well, my kids never got beyond the C, but they did win twice. Okay, and uh, for them that was fantastic. So I recommend it highly. There was never a question about uh, whether they would sink to the bottom. Okay. Uh, the only problem was uh, the coach when I first took them asked me if they could swim the length of the pool, and I said yes. And when I came to pick them up, he said, "Well, you didn't tell me they couldn't get back." And I said, "Well, you didn't ask." So, <laughs> got gotcha. you. Okay, Janice, thanks so much for the call. I appreciate that. So I'm going to bring up a, a, a uh, another myth. Well maybe not myth, but cultural concern about swimming. And I'm particularly interested in the two African-American women that we have sitting here. And that's the issue of the hair. Um, Because I'm just telling you what people have told me. I get it. I get it. We (laughs) hear it all the time. They are very concerned, the African-American women in particular, are very concerned as to what chlorine water does to African-American hair and that because of the amount of money that is spent on maintaining your hair and so forth, that they're not, they're just not going to have anything to do with it. Angela Jones. Well, uh, I do think it's, it's a cultural deterrent from swimming. Um, also, um, I'm thinking about things that we can use to cover our hair. Um, perhaps if we, we did go swimming, we could use shower caps or um, other devices to cover our hair. But um, I think it's a, a huge deterrent. If mm-hmm. you spend a certain amount of money on your hair, uh, that's money gone down the, down the drain if you get to go swimming. Is that, fr- is that frivolous, Cassandra? Uh, the issue of hair? Yeah. Um, I don't think it's frivolous, but I do think that it's a hallmark of a cultural change that has happened in America. Uh, I, I'm old enough where I remember when you went to get your bathing suit, uh, you could also buy a swimming cap. Uh, but you don't find swimming caps easily really? in society anymore. You have to actually go to a specialty shop to find a swimming cap. And so 
you know, that, that I guess because my hair is so short, I never think about that. <laughs> Honestly, that's yeah, that, that that's changed. I mean, it's somewhere in the maybe 1970s that uh, swimming caps went out of vogue. And so it became increasingly more difficult to find them. Uh, you see the swimmers, the perf- you know, the, the competitive Perfect. swimmers who have those, but not the general public. And I think that if those were brought back, that you would have a lot more women. Not that it really keeps a lot of water out say, of, I, because I it, it just, yeah, it doesn't little... really do that. <laughs> and but we what give it... swimming caps away every, okay. every week. Well, what, so what do they say, Leslie, to you? We have some parents, like if the child loses their cap during the week, mm-hmm. they'll come in and say, mom said I can't go in the water because I can't get my hair wet. And I said, the cap's not keeping it completely dry anyway. But we do offer swim caps for that very reason, because parents would have so much apprehension about their daughter's hair getting wet. And so now we've promoted it also for the guys saying, you know, all the cool guys in the Olympics are wearing not one, but two swim caps. Mm -hmm. And so Mm -hmm. uh, set up events provides leftover swim caps for us. And so we're able to give those away. To just, all the kids that want them. Just out of curiosity, what's the age range of, the, say, the average ages of the kids that you teach? We start at age five and go up to adults. Okay. The average age is usually between seven and ten. Okay. And and you find the seven and eight-year, nine-year-olds are the ones that the parents are having apprehension yes. about the hair? Yes. Mm-hmm. Hmm. So we're, we are in need of someone to make a cap. <laughs> or invent a cap for African American <laughs> right. women. Yeah, that actually covers that actually and protects our hair. hair yeah. I believe because most of them do. I mean, the the caps, if they're tight yeah. enough, they're. Yeah. I mean, they're going to protect your hair. Not all of it, you know, right around the hairline, but for the most part, on top of your head, it's going to protect. Because mm-hmm. the caps that they used to have, the you know. As opposed to the ones that they're making today, they had this little they had the little strap, thing. Or clip, right? Yeah, and, and yeah. they they didn't really work. They were really designed to keep your hair in place, as opposed to keep it dry. But but you have to remember, in the 1970s, that's when a lot of African Americans began wearing their hair naturally, mm-hmm. and as that began to change, you know, it, the wearing caps went out of vogue. But mm-hmm. you could see pictures in the 50s and 60s and even earlier than that of many African Americans who were around the pools with all the young ladies wearing caps on their hair. Well, Uh, Go ahead. It used to be where pools required everybody to wear caps because of the, they didn't want the hair in the filters. But another thing that people can do, and this is something that Regina Mobley from Channel 13 taught me, is, is about cholesterol. So you can put cholesterol on your hair and then put the cap on and so you can treat your hair and keep it dry. Hmm. Interesting. Our phone lines are lit up, so let's go to some calls. Uh, Charles joins us from Virginia Beach. Hi, Charles. You're on the air. Hello. How are you doing today? Okay. How are you? Well, I just wanted to uh, lend the perspective from uh, a parks and recreation point of view. I, I worked for uh, parks and recreation for three years. I've worked in the centers, the after-school programs. And uh, I think a great challenge that swimming has to uh, promoting a, a more diverse uh, interest is uh, the economics of it. You, you don't see, except for every four years, swimming becoming really popular um, amongst the um, the idols, you know. I mean, most of the time when I'm in a rec center, I can't get the kids interested in anything other than basketball and football, basketball and football. You know, they all want to be the next LeBron. They all want to be the next, uh, you know, great quarterback or something because they have these dreams of, of this economic aspirations, I suppose. Um, you know, and you don't see a whole lot of, you know, million-dollar women. Okay. Um, and so I just feel like, you know, I know that in the after-school programs and the summer camps, the kids are given plenty of opportunity to go swimming in the pools when they're at a much younger age, but, you know, elementary school age. But once they get to that middle school and seniors and, and, and the high school area, there's just very little incentive for them, uh, you know, um, from a, you know, cultural point of view as far as, you know, I'm not going to grow up to be a million-dollar swimmer, but if I can if I can dunk, I might make a million dollars. Got you. Well, you know, okay, go ahead. Well, Thank you, know, you, Charles, for the call. Go ahead. Uh, he brings up an interesting point. Mm-hmm. Not so much I don't look at as much as a monetary gain, but just an idle aspect. Because you think about 
how many people started playing golf after Tiger Woods got right. into golf? Mm-hmm. Or how many people mm-hmm. got into gymnastics because of Gabby Douglas, you know, initially? Um, you know, you really look at who, who do you see in it? And, and I think somebody well, we mentioned also had earlier. Colin Jones. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And mm-hmm. you think about how many people you see in it. And I think a point was brought up earlier. I can't remember who brought it up about, uh, you know, what you, you know, your, your parents, ex- if, if your Whatever parents you're don't do it. To, yeah. What right. you're exposed to. So mm-hmm. if you don't see people that look like you in doing some activity, that may not be what you may want. To, not because necessarily a monetary game, but just. You know, you said, well, if you don't see people look like you doing this, you may not really see incentive to do it just because you say, well, you know, if nobody else is doing it, and then why therefore I, I can't. Yeah, why should I do well, it? Well, and, and you bring up Colin Jones, and um, the, um, he was also brought up the point in an article that I read that, and he was a 2008 um, Olympic swimmer, correct? Yes. Col- yes. Um, that he said there's also scholarship. And 12. He was also. And 12, right. Mm-hmm. There's also scholarship available for exactly. universities and so forth that people don't think about in terms of if you learn to swim, that that's an, an area. But how many high schools have pools uh, in, in many of the cities today? And especially in the South where you would think they would have lots and lots and lots of pools, but they don't. They've eliminated a lot of the pool programs. And so you have been this uh, almost cultural expectation that people – are not going to go into swimming unless they're coming from a private school or an elite program. And, and so it's almost like a, 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 an argument that has already been decided. What is the outcome? Uh, and especially for African-Americans who tend to go to public schools more often than whites. Mm-hmm. And so all you have to do is see this trend. So when busing started, that's when a lot of the pools got shut down in a lot of the public schools. A lot of those programs were shut down with the argument that black people clearly don't swim and therefore we don't need these programs. I had a swimmer last last summer and his his stroke looked very smooth. I He said he had been in the program three years prior when he was nine. He was now 12. And I said, you know, your stroke is very smooth. Have you taken lessons in between this? And he said, no. And I said, your stroke is so smooth. I will pay for you to be on a swim team if you want to try it. And he said, well, I play football. And this is this little skinny kid. He said, I want to go to, I want to, you know, be a pro football player. And I said, guaranteed with a stroke like that, if you keep it up, you could get a college scholarship because there are scholarships out there for any black swimmer. And he is now swimming. And he's now swimming. Year-round. There you yeah. go. Uh, let's see. Deborah joins us from Virginia Beach. Did I pronounce oh, that correctly? Good afternoon. Deborah. Yes. No, she's um, like Deborah. Oh, okay. <laughs> Deborah. It's Deborah. Deborah. I was correct the first time. Okay. Yes, okay. Good afternoon. <laughs> Hi. As uh, this topic came up, I'm originally from um, down south, on uh, Merritt Island uh, High School, New Cape Kennedy Space Center. And... Um, they, the principal who was at our school um, made it mandatory course that we had to learn how to swim. And the reason was because so many of our uh, African-American uh, individuals was dying in the creeks and in the rivers. Mm-hmm. So I was very pleased with that. And as um, Leslie and Don, the speakers stated, it's a lot it has to do with fear, not being exposed, and being program to believe what we cannot do because of myths that has been gone on for years mm-hmm. and years. Mm-hmm. And it does make a difference, um, but you have to be relaxed. I um, passed the swimming course, but I didn't get my swimming license at a red cross, red cross until I was 26. My children learned how, our children learned how to swim. One of them didn't even take lessons. They just had the natural ability. So it does make a difference. It makes a difference with exposure and again, it's just like the previous um, speaker spoke, there are many scholarships. So we have to get into the community, voice our opinions, and get the city officials to understand what else could be a, a affordable. Because swimming is the one sport they use every muscle in the body. Exactly. Okay. Every muscle in the body. Thank you so much for your call. We really appreciate it. Dr. Jones, let me ask you a question. Our producer, Lisa Godley, says that she can swim um she can do a crawl and so forth but the thought of putting her head under water is just it's terrifying 
that she will not do it. And so, therefore, if she's in deep water and she doesn't know she's in deep water, she's fine. She's swimming along. But as soon as somebody says you're in deep water, that fear just comes and, and envelops her. How do you get past that? Well, exposure is the only way I know to get past So it. dunk her head under there, huh? Yeah, I, <laughs> I didn't I'm, say I'm, that. Yeah, no, no. <laughs> I'm glad you brought that up now. <laughs> Listen. Well, yeah, well, that's interesting. I've been thinking about my own experience. Um, I, I went to lessons with my father when I was maybe six, and I vividly remember standing on the edge of that pool and my father begging me to jump in. The whole time I was there, like I, I, I think I eventually jumped, but I had this uh, fear, and I don't know where it came from. Now, my neither one of my I need I just saw neither one of my parents swim, but my mother was thrown in the water by a teenager when I was young, and I remember seeing it. And my mother never went back towards water, water again. Can. So now I, I don't swim either. So perhaps you know uh, my own experiences is one of which I'm talking about Hmm. where the fear is passed on and once you start having that anxiety it could quickly move towards panic because you know mentally our minds will take over yeah Mm -hmm. it's not about okay you put your feet down honey you only in three feet of water put your feet down (laughs) you know but it's your mentality you're mentally thinking oh i'm I'm a goner and so you can move from anxiety into a panic attack and then you can drown Mm-hmm. So, Leslie, is it a good idea to throw somebody? No, I mean, I'm not being funny. There, <laughs> no. but, but seriously, no. people do that. And it's, it's not a good idea because that's going to have lasting effects on whoever is being the one thrown in. Mm-hmm. It's you need to get people comfortable in the water. Like I said, it's a whole different animal. You when your face is in the water, you can't breathe. When you're running on a football field, you can. So you have to they have to calm down so that they can get their wits about them, put their face in the water. You know, I, I teach I teach anybody, I said, okay, hold your breath right now. And we everybody holds their breath above water. And then I said, okay, we just did that for 10 or 15 seconds. Now let's try putting our faces in the water and doing the same thing. And they realize, and again, it's trust. You know, you have to get their yeah. trust. So yeah. the exposure should be gradual and not right. sudden. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Okay. All right. Michael joins us from Newport News. Hi, Michael. You're on the air. Hello. I, I just wanted to say that, that I, of course, I've heard a lot of the conversation is exposure is everything if you're trying to really get people to learn how to swim mm-hmm. and if you have any fear of it. Because the whole thing is that, you know, we've been doing things that people didn't think we could do forever. And so, I mean, I, I started swimming uh, really to increase my ability to run. But my first exposure was because my, my mother happened to buy a house that had a pool. And my, unfortunately, my mother's passed away. And so I don't know if her intention was that we learned how to swim. But I, I didn't learn to swim at that time. I could, I could dog pedal, but I didn't learn how to swim at that time. I learned to swim later. And the reason I, I always had confidence was because in my mind, I was saying, well, you know, if I can run five miles, you better believe I can learn how to swim, you know, five <laughs> miles. And so, uh, but it was, it was just the exposure. But the other thing is that, um, if you have a person who's actually getting really good lessons, that's part of the lesson plan is that you, you take each individual person and you teach them based on the person, not based on, you know, we've got 10 people in the pool and everybody's going to do this. Exactly. So, right. but, um, but a lot of people, if they're exposed to it and they're exposed, uh, you know, properly with, with really good lessons, mm-hmm. they're going to gain confidence. And if you really want to get good at swimming, it's, it's about endurance anyway. You have to do it in repetition. Okay. And, and you have to learn all those different strokes. Thank practice, you, Michael. Practice, we appreciate practice. it. Practice all the time. Dr. Cassandra Newby Alexander. So I know that, if I'm not mistaken, there was a beach on the eastern shore um, that was for uh, Silver Beach, I think it was called, that was for African Americans. Is mm-hmm. that right? Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, we talk a lot about pools, but there were also actual beaches and bodies of water that um, historically were segregated. And I'm wondering... Well, they were usually black-owned. Uh, ah. There were a few places, such as City Beach in Norfolk, mm-hmm. that was designated for blacks only. It was a tiny little beach, mm-hmm. uh, mm-hmm. And, as opposed to Ocean View that was huge for whites. Uh, and a lot of blacks uh, were there, Buckrow, uh, over in Hampton. 
same thing, where you had a section for blacks and a section for whites, and the section for blacks was very small. Uh, Hampton University, uh, when it was Hampton Institute, uh, had their students out there all the time, um, you know, in, on the weekends, swimming, uh, learning how to swim because they didn't have a pool on campus for a long time. So they actually taught the students how to swim at those beaches. Mm-hmm. Um, but again, it, it, you know, it goes back to sort of this issue I was talking about before, and that is as we got more into the 20th century, into the 1970s and 80s, you started to see a doing away of these programs, these opportunities for African Americans to actually engage, unless you're talking about upper middle class African Americans who had their own pools or who had access to a wide variety of things. Mm -hmm. Uh, For the general population, they didn't have access. Leslie, you brought up the fact that that a lot of your students are from lower um, um, socioeconomic neighborhoods. And so do you have a special uh, pricing range or how do you make it affordable for the kids to come? We charge three dollars a week for each child. I don't care. We will take any minority child. I don't care what their socioeconomic um, status is. Mm-hmm. For other children, they have to be um, free or reduced lunches because the whole reason for the program was to teach minority children how to swim, black children how to swim. And so nobody has, we didn't used to charge. The charge is basically basically to make sure the parents buy in and bring the children to the program. We would have 35 children sign up or, you know, parents sign 35 children up and half of them would show up on Monday. Without so having the, some kind of, of buy-in or game. So in it's the a game, $3 so dollar buy-in okay. fee. And if there is only one person since we've started this, which was three years ago, has asked for a reduced fee. You know, three dollars for seven and a half hours of lessons in the water is is nothing. And where are, tell people where they can find you and and where the swimming lessons are held. We hold the swimming lessons in Virginia Beach at the Timber Lake uh, Homeowners Association Windsor Oaks Pool. They donate the pool for free. Um, we have children as far as Yorktown, Emporia, Cortland. Wow. I mean, we have children from all over Hampton Roads and beyond. Um, they can get in touch with me. We have a website, rapswim.org, and we Rap, also have a R-A-P-S Facebook. S S W I M dot org, and we also have a Facebook page that people can get in touch with me. Fantastic. That is fantastic. Barbara, this yes. whole conversation, mm-hmm. it, you know, it, it really, I think, dovetails very nicely into this whole, uh, I call it a brouhaha during the Olympics over, uh, you know, the first African-American to win this and that. And instead of really having us look at this not as some surprise, uh, but rather as, you know, this is unfortunate that opportunities uh, were delayed until now for African-Americans to essentially prove that they are just as much of an athlete in this field as other individuals. It's really an issue of access, not uh, 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 what is it, uh, possibility of, mm-hmm. of them having the ability to swim. Um, and I've heard a lot of commentators um, speak about it as if they're surprised that a black person had the ability to do this as opposed to really bemoaning that it took us so long to get to this point because of a lack of access. It still amazes me that in 2016 that we still have firsts. Well, I'm not surprised. I'm not surprised because in 2016 we're still technically, we're still not in the 20th century yet. We're still suffering from the, the race line, the color line that W.B. Du Bois talked about in 1902 in his book, Souls on Black Folk. Um, and so it's really going to take us a few more years before we get past that point. So a lot of the stuff that we didn't address in the 20th century or that became a big issue racially in the 20th century is still lingering with us now. But we're going to see that as we confront these issues, as we overcome some of these issues, they'll become less of an issue. Dr. 
Newbie, you have the last word. We got oh. less than a minute. Oh, I, I'm, I fell asleep over here. <laughs> 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 I'm sorry. <laughs> no, actually, you know, all jokes aside, though, I, I think that the key thing is just uh, you know, creating more access. Uh, you know, that that is probably one of the biggest things. I love this program. I, I you know, I never heard of it, and it goes to show if you're not exposed to things, you don't hear about things. I mean, my youngest loves swimming. We were in uh, uh, St. Thomas, and she, I mean, that's her thing. I mean, she begged us to go back again this uh, past year just so she could go swimming. So just to watch her do that, and I told my wife, I said, listen, let's just go ahead and take her. I said, because it's worth it, just watch her want to go that that uh, right. you know, that, that dearly to want to go. So I, I encourage it. So Okay, keep. and with that, we are out of time. Thank you all so very much for joining me. That's Thank Leslie you. Paul with RAPS program, Dr. Angela Jones, Dr. Cassandra Newby alexander and Dr. Keith Newby. And we'll be right back. So fly. Labor Day weekend, join us for Q's Fest, a free celebration of Norfolk urban life, transforming community through interactive art, fresh food, back to school giveaways, and a live performance from international artist Masego. The Fuzz Band and DJB is sure to have the crowd lit. Join us September 3rd from noon to 8 in the downtown Norfolk Church Street District. That's right across the street from 700 East Only Road. For more info, go to teamswithapurpose.org or call 757 747 Two six seven nine. That's Teens with a Purpose, and we allowed them to use their PSA. They produced that themselves. They are a fabulous organization that works with young people here in the Hampton Roads area, and so come on out and support them. They came from many different communities, all determined to participate in the fight for equality. Some faces you'll recognize, others you won't, but they all share a common bond, a determination to make the world a better place for themselves, their families, and an entire race of disenfranchised people. Lisa Godley gives us a peek at the Chrysler Museum's rich collection of photos featuring women and civil rights movement. I've seen death. But the mall stays the same. The things they saw and the injustices they endured are a painful yet significant part of American history. And if you look closely into the eyes of the women whose faces line the exhibit walls, you'll see a determination to bear whatever was thrown their way if it meant equal rights for everyone. There are some photographs that are, are painful to look at because the gestures and the the hate is there. Photos made it real. Photos demanded that people in Congress stop ignoring the situation. Rock curator of American art, Alex Mann, says the photos are part of a rich collection that the Chrysler Museum has been acquiring for almost 50 years. It's our responsibility at the museum to always be thinking about what works we have in our vaults that people will want to see and talk about, share these works with them, and contribute to things that are important in our world right now. Look past the history and you'll see images that easily resemble current events, ranging from peaceful marches to explosive confrontations. While famous men like Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and James Baldwin took center stage delivering speeches and meeting with politicians, countless women refused to sit in silence and bravely endured water cannons, attack dogs, and constant threats to their own existence in an effort to help others achieve basic human rights. Women like Gwen Gillen, who moved from Wisconsin to Mississippi to make a difference. What we're seeing in this photograph is a young black woman who's sitting on the front porch of a house that looks like it's in the countryside. You can see the paint peeling a little bit on the wall. She's speaking, she's gesturing, and there's a man sitting in front of her. She's a volunteer who is working for the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, and she is out meeting with these local residents and helping them prepare to take literacy tests so that hopefully they can pass these tests and register to vote. Some of the featured photos were taken by women photographers. Maria Varela left her home in Chicago to volunteer with SNCC. 
That's when she picked up a camera for the very first time and found she had a real knack for it. She recognized that the movement needed more photographs. They needed imagery to use on posters, to use in publicity materials, and also to use in their pamphlets that were teaching people how to read. Among the photos displayed is Varilla's 1966 photograph titled the March Against Fear. They're walking down a road in the rain through the countryside, and it's a beautiful photograph because you can see the downward streaks of the rain, you can see the wet clothes, a few have umbrellas, most have soggy hats or scarves over their heads, and there are at least 30 people that we can see in the line walking down this dirt road and so you feel the intensity of their commitment. The March Against Fear started in Memphis and ended in Jackson, Mississippi. What's even more moving than the photograph itself is the story behind it. It started with one man, James Meredith, who said that he was going to march in protest. On the second day of his march, he was shot by a sniper. And so while he's in the hospital, all of his friends, all of those who respected and supported what he was trying to do, went and took up the march on his behalf. So a march that began with one person has, by the time this photograph was taken, turned into hundreds of people. Mann is quick to point out that this isn't a who's who or even a timeline of the civil rights movement, but part of a magnificent collection of photographs telling one inspiring story after another about people who participated in a movement that helped shape a nation. For another view, I'm Lisa Godley. And the Chrysler Museum's Women and the Civil Rights Movement photography exhibit runs through October 30th and admission is free. And that's our show for today. We hope we have inspired you to take some swimming lessons if you cannot swim. It's great exercise and it's fun. If you'd like to hear this show again or share it with a friend, go to our website, anotherviewradio.org, and download the podcast. You can also carry us with you on your smartphone by downloading the WHRO Media app from your Apple or Android store. And you can find Another View, the radio show, on Facebook, so like us. And I'm on Twitter at Barbara Ham Lee. Next week, we talk with Arthur D. Watkins about his book, The Cook-Up. Hear the true story of how a college-bound student takes over the dubious drug dynasty of his deceased brother and the life lessons he learned. You won't want to miss this incredible story of life, love, and the streets of my hometown, Baltimore. The theme, Our theme music was composed and performed by Jay Sennett, Lisa God is our show producer. Victor Bowen is our audio engineer and Aisha Hack George answered our phones. I'm Barbara Ham Lee. Join me tomorrow night at 8 on WHRO TV 15 for summer surf and beach music we love. It's your chance to support what you love, public media. Let's get together again next Friday at noon for another view.